And we're back with another guest in the studio, Joe Corsia. What's up? Woo! A.K.A. Lupo, <laughs> A.K.A. Oh, yeah. the host of the Everyday Ultra podcast. Actually, I gotta take this sweet John G. jacket off. I wore my Animal Party shirt for you. Oh my so. gosh, that yeah. is rad. Time oh to my. celebrate that this. That is a lot of cool animals <laughs> out there. That looks like a Cocodona hallucination. Yeah. I have matching pants, too. It's technically a pajama shirt. <laughs> so good. So Joe and I got to spend some time together out on course. I yes. paced Joe from Sedona up to Schnebly Hill. Um, so, yeah, we had a good time out there. And you were a great um, pacer. It was so much oh, fun. Thanks. We had a lot of laughs, <laughs> a lot of, like, like – it was the high. We you got to experience the highest point of my race, which is awesome, yeah, and then probably yeah. one of the lowest moments, like directly after. So yeah, we got to tell people this story. Like, so I want to hear from Joe what exactly happened because you know he was like a tenth of a mile behind me on this Kasner climb, and if, for those of you who know Kasner climb is it's pretty steep. We're still going uphill, and all of a sudden Joe is like pounding at my heels, and I'm like, what is going on? You know, I had to start running. My heart rate was at threshold and he's 170 miles into the race. And I'm just like, whoa. So what, what happened? I, and you told me at that moment that that was like your high yeah, of the it, race. It was what really happened? interesting. And I think it was like one of those moments that like really kind of encapsulate these 200 milers. And this was my first 200 miler too. So like I had heard of it, but never truly experienced it. And at this point I had experienced it like multiple times where you know, you can just get highs that come out of like nowhere from like the most random thing. Um, and I've learned like throughout like the race, like over the past few days, like when you get that high, like lean into that and like use it as much as possible. And I, I bet a lot of people might be like hearing and, and thinking about like, oh, it must have been like some mental strategy or things. But I'll be honest, literally what it was, I had a playlist that was just on rocking. And I had a few did. songs that were coming up that were like, you know, motivating, but like, you know, just kind of like playing. And for some odd reason, and I can't tell you why, like I don't have like super emotional resonance with the song, but it was a song called like Family Matters by Drake. And for some reason, like that song came on and like something clicked. Like it honestly felt like I was almost like possessed in the moment, like I wasn't me. Because right before then I was feeling super tired. Like I was kind of like trying to keep my eyes open. But like as soon as that song came on, like all my energy kind of came back. I felt like this thing like in my head just being like, you can get up this thing, like push as hard as you can. And I just let it go. And what was odd, it like didn't feel like I was like burning the candle. Like it just felt like I was being taken over by something. And I was leaning into the music and like just diving in and I was just like, ride this high, ride this high, don't let it stop, ride the high. And that's like when I started to get up there and you remember too i was like saying like let's go like i was just trying to like build a hype as much as possible so i think it's like and then i've learned like throughout that kind of time it's like when you hit those low points just try and like throw things like at you as much as possible and like when you do get that high like ride it and so yeah it was just a, a simple drake song and funny enough i played that song maybe 15 times <laughs> After in the race, after so anytime I was at a low point, I put it on and it would actually help. Like, wow. Ton. Yeah. Well, so was that still you still maintain that that was like the highest point of the race, or did you have like another high? I think I had definitely had a few more highs out there. I think that was one of the, I think that was like the high high, like because um, in terms of just like how I felt and this like the strong feeling, like I had that moment. Like if you ask me like how I felt, like I, I truly in that moment felt like I hadn't ran, you know, 170 miles already. Whereas if you asked me like five minutes before that, I would have told you, I feel like I ran 225 miles. So it was really interesting. And that was really the last point in the race where I really felt like that. Um, I mean, the finish line was also like a super high, but I, I feel like that's yeah. a different kind of comparison Obvious. experience. Right. Mm -hmm. So, but yeah, that was definitely like the pinnacle, like high point. And not to say that I didn't enjoy the rest of it, but like just from like a, energy perspective and like uh you know let's dig deep that was that was the high point i call those moments hype spikes yes <laughs> that was that's yes. a good term for can it can be dangerous if yes. you uh have too many and don't stay even keel but it sounds like you found the hype spike right at the right moment and harnessed its power exactly greatly. yeah that was a hype spike for sure and like what was interesting too is like right after that we get onto schnebly and like we're feeling good and like 
Bree's like, okay, like we can like make up good time here. Like it's just like road. Like we can just keep it going. And for some reason, like out of nowhere, like my feet were hurting so bad. And I thought it was my quads originally because like it was just radiating so much. And I remember telling Bree, I was like, it just hurts. So like my, my legs just hurt so bad. Um, I tried to take, I took a dirt nap, like just to try and like reset. I woke up, like it was worse. And then like, I tried to stay in tune with my body. I was like, oh, this is my feet right now. <laughs> um, and I remember like every step was like so painful. So it was like, you get to this like amazing high and then you get to this incredible low. And like, I think that was like the whole experience of Cocodona for me. It was just like, like there was no middle ground. It was either I was really high or I was like really low. Like I barely had those like chill points. Like it was, it was uh, honestly just wild. Riding the Coco Loco roller coaster. What were, it, yeah. what oh, were yeah. some of those like lowest lows? What? There was a lot. I think, I think um, one of the lowest lows for me, uh, maybe I guess going chronologically, uh, I think, so coming after Crown King, um, Crown King, going into it, I felt fine. I love that section. I think it's awesome. It's very difficult. I'm not trying to say it's easy by any means, but I, I personally love that section. I was excited to do it. Um, and I knew like once you kind of get over that, you're like, I told myself like the hardest part is over. Like it really is like yeah. course wise. So I was like really stoked coming out of Crown King, but then I kind of noticed like my stomach was feeling really weird like I was feeling nauseous um and it was odd because like my nutrition was on point I was eating like all to schedule I was taking my electrolytes and I did like a lab test to do like sweat raid and so like I was nailing everything and for some reason my stomach just went completely south and I just couldn't hold anything down and um I went into the next section like super depleted and that was a very like low point just because you know anyone who's been in ultra before and you have stomach issues it's it's, it's not great. It's the number one cause of DNF. So I'm not saying it was going to DNF, but you know, you get that thought. It's like, I'm facing this 40 miles in to a 250 mile race, um, on this very runnable section after crown King where I can really be making up some time. And I felt like I wasn't going full potential and you know, I can, ca I kind of caught my mind, like kind of predicting the rest of the race from that. Um, and yeah, I mean, it did get to me in that moment. Like, I'm not going to lie. I also made a, some really dumb mistakes on like my pack stuffing on that section just because it was a long section without crew. So that was really, really low. And I remember like just getting back to like my bearings being like, okay, how do you make this a good section? Like, how do you, what can you do right now to make this a good section? It was like, all right, keep trying to like get food down, uh, breathe and send me a text. And she was like, Hey, like try liquid calories out there. I tried that out. That helped a ton. And then I found that all I could really get down was gummy worms. So like I probably <laughs> had like my weight in gummy worms like on that section and it revived me. And wow. then I had a high again because I remember like texting the group. I was like, I'm feeling great. Yep. Like I was hitting like my A goal time. Like I was like super ripping. So um, yeah, like that was a big low. And then another really, really big low. Um, this section, so I paced this section last year and I was pacing it. And to me, it was like, very mind bending and it was the walnut canyon section so that section is so long it's like fort so Tahill, two walnut yes. canyon sorry yeah fort okay. Tahill, two walnut yeah i love that section. um yeah it's to me though it's so long it's so late in the race it's right before eldon this is just um, sorry to interrupt you joe i think is this jess coming in yes. we gotta finish all her. right we have a lot of people um cheering on jess in the chat so just want to give her a shout out strong finish Sorry to interrupt you. Sorry to interrupt you on that. Oh, no, no. Je Congratulations to Jess. That's amazing. No, I, I love seeing the finish. I think it's just the coolest thing to see, like, anyone finish, whether it's this race, Sedona, or Elden. Like, it's just, it, it makes me emotional every time, like, just to see that. So, yeah, please, anyone finishing, interrupt me, like, all the time. Um, but, yeah, you were, so you were talking about that, um, that section between Tuthill and Walnut. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, so I paced my buddy Aaron Fleischer, uh, last year and it was during the Aaron. night and I remember being the pacer and feeling like oh this is long section and I did it during the day here so I was like okay it's not gonna be at night so we're gonna be good but for some reason it was just so long and I wasn't moving at the speed I wanted to and like I remember like my buddy who's my pacer he's like hey man like cuz I asked him I was like how long do we have at the aid station he said six more miles and like in a split second, like my mind started doing the math. It's like, well, if I'm moving like 
20 mile or sorry, like 20 minute per mile pace. And I'm doing this, like that's going to get me here. And like, I got to do Elden. And like all of a sudden my brain just kind of started freaking out and was like, oh, I'm going to be out of here for still a long time. And I remember catching myself and just being like, okay, you can't do this right now. Like you those cannot. calculations are not helpful. Yeah. I was, I was like, you can't do this. So I told my pacer, I was like, Hey, I'm going to sit down. I'm going to take a one minute nap. I need a reset. And I did that. I got up and I told myself, all right, all you're going to focus on is the next step. And that kind of calmed it down. But like that, like one second moment was like a, it was a very, very low point. Um, but I tried not to let it get to the point where it got up there. And I think like, that's the whole thing is like trying to, when you have those low moment, moments, like recognize it and try to problem solve it in the moment. So it doesn't like go into this like huge death spiral out there. And I think like, I personally did a good job at that. Um, but like those low moments, I mean, like they were low. I mean, I probably cried maybe like 12 times out there. Like, at, <laughs> you know, it was, um, it was wild, but like, I think I did a good job at like recognizing that, like once the tears are flowing, okay, how do I get out of it? Yeah. Catching it before it escalates and then yeah. becomes a bigger thing than it is. It's that, that'll definitely help kind of keep you even keel. Yep. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, it's like a problem solving kind of game. Like I think what I've learned is the longer, and this is something I coach with my athletes as well. I always say like the longer the distance you go, it's not as much about like preventing the mistakes. I mean, yes, of course, like you want to do what you can to prevent the mistakes as much as possible. But the longer you go, Murphy's Law comes into place. Like things are inevitably going to go wrong. And so your determination of success is going to be more weighted on how you solve those problems as opposed to like, how do I prevent this as much as possible? Because listen, you can have, listen, my foot care strategy, like by the book textbook was like no other. And I still got blisters. My nutrition strategy, like I said, I did lab tests. I did all this stuff on point. My stomach still went South. So like, and in the end of the day though, like you got to see those things and be like, okay, I have this thing, but I need to figure out how to solve it. And it's not like what you go through, it's how you manage it. And for a 200 mile race, plus mile race, 250, I mean, that's going to determine whether you have, you know, an 87 hour finish or a, you know, 100 hour finish, right? Not saying that time is like the main goal, but like, even so, just from how well you do out there, you, you got to be a problem solver. And I think like in a race like Cocodona, like that's like the main mode you got to be in. Yeah, and just in case you're wondering, Joe Corsione finished in 86 hours, 44 seconds. What a nice, even number that is. <laughs> uh, you were the 29th male, I believe. Mm -hmm. That's sweet. Just cracking the top 30. Yep, it was cool. Yeah, I, it, it was funny. I, you know, I like to be very competitive. Um, I think it's no surprise to a lot of people that I'm very outspoken about the goals that I like to go out and reach. Um, cause I do like to compete and I did have a time goal for this race. I did want like, yeah, I said like, if the cards come out, like I'd love to be top 10 or things like that at the same time though. And I encourage anyone doing this to go in distance first of their kind is like your a goal, like no matter what, like if you're doing a distance the first time should just be to finish. And the reason why I say that is because, and I never wanted to get myself to this point is like, you don't want to make super costly mistakes that try and get you to this like goal that you don't even know how you're gonna feel like at a certain point at the sake of the finish, right? And for me, like I was like, even if I get like 100 hours and finish the thing, like I'll be stoked. Um, but I did wanna compete. So there was a point during the race where I knew I wasn't hitting my splits and I knew it was like way out of reach of what I wanna do in my time goal. And for like three minutes, I let myself have it for like, okay, like this stinks, like, oh my gosh, like I didn't hit my splits. But again, I can feel like that was when the race like would would have would have not been fun for me. And so I, I remember saying to my pacer in that moment, I said, hey, I know I'm off my splits. Now my goal is just to do the very best that I can do for the rest of the race. And in that moment, like I started to really like fully go back to enjoying the race for what it was. So yeah, like, I mean, my time goal, like, I'll be honest, and this is going to sound ludicrous for what I finished in, like, it was, it was 70 hours, like, I wanted to get 70 hours. That's um, not ludicrous. And uh, I thought I could do it. And I truly believe that if I fixed a lot of the mistakes, knowing what I know now, like, if I could go out and do it again, I'm confident I can get that. Um, but uh, I'm when I cross that finish line, like, and I haven't had a thing where I've sat there and been like, I regret that or like I stink or I didn't hit the goal. Like I'm very proud of it. Cause like, I mean, 
the furthest I ran before this was 100 miles, like to do 250, I mean, it's just awesome. So I think like, you know, just finishing for me is, is amazing and just leaning into that and not putting too much pressure on myself, like once the goal is out of reach, because, you know, I know for me, I can get very disappointed in myself and uh, I didn't want to ruin that from the experience of being out there and having so much fun and spending time with my amazing pacers and um, my crew who was there, like, and so, um, yeah. That, that finishing is, is such a huge accomplishment yeah, yeah exactly yeah exactly and it's so um i was i was very proud to get that so pr and distance too so at least yeah. at least i got one pr which is great. <laughs> yeah yeah i think we have that in common it's fun being vocal about your goals it's a little bit scary but mm -hmm. it i don't know and it, it was it's interesting talking to different runners who like take it a different way um but you do have that risk of okay if i don't get this goal like what do people think of me? And it seems like you've done a really incredible job just figuring out how to process that and still have self-love for your accomplishments. And um, yeah, I don't know. I'd love to dig into that more because mm -hmm. I do think it's a unique-ish thing being so like bold and and I love it. <laughs> yeah, and you you made a really good point. I think this is you know why why. You, you know, we've had conversations about this in the past, you and I, I know, like, and it's something that I completely understand. It's when you do those moments, like you re like, and, and I don't know if you feel the same way, but I remember when I wasn't hitting my splits and everything. And I remember like telling people like, this was my goal. I put it on my podcast. Like I put it out there. Um, and you start to think about like everybody who says, I'm going to be tracking you. I'm going to be watching you. And like, you realize that you have a spot tracker literally pinging every five minutes and like you, they can see the pace slower and those things do pop in your head. It's like, Oh man, like I feel like I'm letting people down. I feel like I'm letting my crew down. Like I even caught myself like apologize. I, I apologize to Brio. I was like, Hey, I'm moving slower than like, you know, planned here. Um, and once you realize, I think the thing that helps me a ton is like, even when, I'm off my goal. Um, and this goes for anyone. I think everyone can relate to this. Like you will still get the love and support that, you know, you are going to get for doing incredible things. Even if you think that thing isn't incredible in the moment, like, and I'm not saying you're doing this to, you know, make other people think it's incredible, but it, like in the end of the day, no one's going to hate you for missing your goal. No one's going to think that you are a, you know, a uh, loser or like someone who isn't going to push it yourself. I truly believe if you give your very best and you give that honest effort, that is what people are going to cherish in the end of the day. And again, it's that's not what you're kind of going for, but I do think it helps me to go those things because very much so like that is something for me that I think about. So I realize all the time it's saying like, if I just do my very best, like that is, that's the biggest goal. And I know like, and listen, even if someone, if I gave my very best and someone came to me and said like, yeah, well, you suck. You didn't hit your goal. That's not a person I want to be with anyway. So I, I kind of shift that focus to say like, what's the very best that I can do in this moment? And like that totally helps with literally anything. And so um, whether my very best at that moment is 100 hours or, you know, 90 hours, it doesn't matter the goal. Like, I think if you leave no stone unturned and you can confidently say you gave your very best, that's what it is. And I'll even say, just to kind of wrap this long point up, um, where that kind of comes to mind to me, mo most notably in the race, um, and shout out to Melissa Asazuski. She paced me from the Walnut Aid Station to the finish. And uh, she's a, like, just, you know, very good competitor. Um, I told her not to go easy on me because I knew it was the last stretch. And I was, in, I was hurting at this point big time. Uh, we get up Eldon. I was falling asleep going up Eldon. Like, I was in an extreme state of sleep deprivation. I was seeing people, like, in the rocks. Like, I, yes. I was losing my mind. The smoke was getting to me, too. Like, I was I was a wreck going up Eldon. Um, so we get up to Eldon, um, and I'm pretty destroyed. And Melissa looks at me, and she goes, okay, like, you're going to sit down. We're going to have like, a little two-minute break. And she goes, I hope you're going to enjoy this because – after we get to the aid station, there's, there's no break. And I was like, what? And she's like, yeah, we're going to like run hard down this hill. And in my head, I'm like, Oh God, <laughs> like I have so many blisters. Oh gosh. Like this is going to be painful. And I remember starting out the section, like when we got out of the aid station and I, she was running ahead, like running like at like a nine minute per mile pace. And I think I started out at like 11 minutes per mile and she was getting further and further. And in the moment I said, I asked myself, I was like, are you giving your very best right now? And I said, no. And I was like, 
well, you better change that because tomorrow, guess what? Like you're going to be in the position. The thing that I always say myself is like, I never want to be in a position where not just the next day, but like months down the road to think back and be like, I wish I pushed harder at Cocodona. That sucks. Like not missing your goal. Like I think, yeah, that, that, that sucks. But what really sucks is like knowing you could have pushed harder. Mm -hmm. And I said, I'm not going to let that happen. So I was literally 190 heart rate going down this thing at like, 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 you know, nine minutes per mile. And I was like, this is definitely my very best. So, um, I was like very proud of that moment. And I think like, that's why I have no qualms on the race and, and to bring everything full circle, even if you have high standards for yourself, I think the best standard anyone should have is are you giving 100% into anything you're doing? Because there's nothing that can take away anything from that if you truly do that. And again, even if everyone ditches you, you feel good about yourself. And I always say the crux of life is fulfillment and how I define fulfillment is how you feel about yourself when you're by yourself. And I truly think that comes from like this innate like, you know, strength of knowing that you're giving everything that you have and anything that you pursue. Yeah, I've I've so played well said. Yeah. with that yeah. tactic as well. Mm-hmm. The am I doing my best right now? And if I answered yes, then I could, I could keep doing it, you know? Yeah. And it just it helps you move it forward too mm-hmm. and sleep at night. Yeah, for <laughs> sure. Exactly. Yeah. And it's a good question to ask like in ultras because like and this is something that I you know I don't want to say like struggled with at Cocodona, but it's it's something I learned because I'd never done the distance. But like I was very like I don't want to say confused, but like just I guess unsure of like how much to push when. Because I'd never done like hundred miles, like I'm pretty comfortable at like when to push and when to not push. And I mean Shelby, you know the year that I, you paced me at Havelina, like I've gone out way too fast in distances before and it's cost me greatly. Um, thankfully that year you helped me to get a way faster time than what I would have had before. But um, I knew I did not want to go out hard here. So I went like pretty conservative in the beginning and I felt like I went maybe way too conservative like throughout the like beginning stages of the race. And I probably could have pushed a little bit more. And there's even times where I slept a little bit more, where everything on that too. So it's like doing your best is maybe not even just like, you know, a standpoint of like you're tired and you're not pushing. It's like doing your best is also like, you know, do you, are you like, you know, confident enough to maybe take the risk here? Are you confident enough to like, you know, maybe push it a little bit more or things like that. And I think, you know, that's, that's another thing, you know, it kind of comes into the after kind of fold of it, but um, to kind of get to that mode, I, I think like that was like my biggest thing is like, when do I push and when do I get there? And like, there was moments it's like, are you doing your best? It's like, yeah, I'm doing my best, but like, do I really want to do like full potential here? You know? So it's an interesting thing, but I think like late in the race, that's the best question to ask yourself. Am I doing my best? Because no matter what, every person listen to this, if your answer that's no, then like literally like every single person will get that emotional reaction that is definitely negative and you're going to want to change that. Yeah, I love this comment in the chat. Uh, I'm convinced that runners are modern day philosophers. Running forces the question why. And I think this this conversation, like, yeah, I feel that. <laughs> oh, for sure. And, you know, Bryce uh, from Air Viper asked me after the race, like literally as soon as I crossed the finish line, he was like, if you could uh, describe the experience in five words or less, like what would you do, uh, describe Cocodona as? I don't actually remember. I, I quite frankly don't remember the conversation like at all, um, just because I was so sleep deprived. <laughs> but I looked at the video again and I, I said something along the lines of like a deep personal introspective experience. And I've learned so much over 100 miles, 50 miles, 100K, but the things that I learned about myself in the high moments, the low moments, how I deal with obstacles, how I deal with, you know, interacting with other people, how I deal with treating myself, like I learned so much out there. And I think it's such like a beautiful experience with ultra running. It's like where you really find not just the most beautiful parts about yourself, but even just the most like, like the parts that need the most work. Like even from like me, like I was like, I could be better, not just as a runner in this area, but as a person in this area, looking at the qualms of that. And when you go over the course of 250 miles, like you go through that experience, like you really get to see the raw, like stuff that's inside of you when all like the, 
you know, uh, comforts of life are stripped away and you're super cold and the wind is whipping and your legs hurt and you got blisters and like you're going slow and like you haven't slept in, you know, a day and so like that's when you truly get to see it's like who you are in that moment. And even if it like is terrible, like there's something beautiful in that. And you can ultimately choose to take that not in your running, but in your life. And so like for me, like these are things where I'm even assessing like, how do I show up as a better coach? Like from what I learned from Cocodona, how do I show up as a better husband? How do I show up as a better, um, you know, podcast host and, you know, future, future father for when I eventually have kids, right? Like, so I'm not expecting soon anyways, by the way. So please uh, don't, don't uh, get that. Uh, that wasn't news or anything. But, <laughs> Joe's um, wife is also currently running Elden Crest 38, her longest distance today. And he is her coach. Yes. And she's crushing it too, which is awesome. And then one of my other athletes, Brittany Westdyke is also running with her, which is super super cool like they're together so yeah they're doing great but yeah anyways I I I say you know if you want to if you're an ultra runner and you want to get to know yourself like as much as possible like run a 200 plus mile race like for sure and uh I mean I recommend Cocodona it's just that's why it is my first one it's just like I don't think there's a there's a there's a better 200 plus mile race than Cocodona yeah I mean not only is it an incredible course but the energy around it Air Viper community, the runners that come here, it just is magnetic. Mm. And I don't know, there's really nothing like what you feel here. I think Sedona's put some crystal powder over Cocodona and it's just super special. Yeah, for real. There is that aura, that vibe. This is that, yeah. Steve Darimer coming in to the yeah. finish here. And Dan, and Dan Savage, just the two of them really close together. Yeah. I am curious why the, the finish Canyons. line shoot changed a little. I'm sure it's something with Maybe because city. of that van parked there? I don't uh, know. The courthouse. They have to close that. Oh, okay. Ah, uh, the so courthouse. The courthouse. I mean, All the right. zoning <laughs> that happens with a race that's a point-to-point 250-mile -point event. Uh, we had protected owls on course. It's like incredible what this race organization has to do to make sure all the runners are safe and that we're taking the best care of the environment. Mm -hmm. So that leads me to a question. Where for you was that moment where you looked around and you were just like, oh my gosh, this is beautiful. You know, I, a lot of people ask me this question, like, of like, what's like your favorite section of the course? Or like, where do you like, you get that like awe inspiring moment. There's, there's definitely two for me. The first one, um, and I had done this section like before in practice, but is the like basically once you get after the Cottonwood Aid Station up to Crown King, like that initial ascent. Now, a lot of people might be thinking like, you thought that was the most beautiful? And I, I made myself an intention of this. I said, hey, anytime like I'm mentally feeling like I'm struggling from the climb, turn around. Because if you go up that climb and you turn around, it is beautiful. Like you see like all the Bradshaws that some parts you can see like downtown Phoenix, like from there, like it is gorgeous. And I live in Phoenix personally, like those mountains are very remote. Like they're not training grounds. And so like you, like for me being in Phoenix, like being like, I'm in a place like where I drive past all the time on the I-17 and like very few people get to go here and see this view. So like to me, just like seeing that is like such an appreciation and such a beauty. And it's like, I get to see this part of like, you know, the outside Phoenix area that very, very few people are getting to experience. So um, I think that's just such a, an amazing, um, just privilege to have in that moment. And, you know, grateful for, you know, Air Viper for providing like such a unique experience, which is so cool. The second part, and I think a lot of people um, have, have shared the sentiment too. When you get up to Mingus and you look at that view and you see the Red Rocks of Sedona to your left, and then like in the distance, you see Humphreys like with the snow on top and mm -hmm. things like that. And you realize in that moment, you're like, I'm going to be traveling there on my feet. Like, and it could be overwhelming, but every, like when I saw that, it was like, I, I almost cried. I'm getting emotional right now. Cause it's like, I'm doing this. Like, this is, this is the adventure. Like, this is like, how rad is that to like do that? And I remember keep saying like my pacers throughout, I was like, I can't believe I ran here from Phoenix. Like that is like, it's just so cool. Like it's so um, like leaning into like those moments of beauty, like when you're out there is great. And I mean, I tell my athletes all the time, I was like, hey, if you're like in a bad spot mentally and like you're trying to like get things to like, you know, work internally, I say, 
make instead of focusing internal, go external and appreciate the beauty around you. Like you, even if you're in an area that like maybe seemingly isn't beautiful, like in the moment, like find something to appreciate. Is there like a flower? Is there like a plant? Like something like that. And with Cocodona, I think in every section of the course, and I would argue this to the, like to the death, I think there's ev there's something beautiful to appreciate at every single step on that course. And I think it's amazing. Even if it, you're at night because at night, listen, I was at going to Kelly Canyon. It's just a dirt road. It's a dirt road that basically you just go into the abyss. But I remember like me and my buddy, he, my, my pacer at the time, um, I was in a low one there and he just goes, hey, he's like, turn off your headlamp, turn off my headlamp. He goes, look up, <laughs> looked up at the stars. And I was like, wow, like this is yeah. incredible. So even if you're in the dark, there's some to appreciate. Star breaks, I had a pacer <laughs> teach me that. Yeah, so good, <laughs> so good, yeah. Joe, are you, I know this might be a little early to ask this question, but are you gonna be making a reappearance at Cocodona in the future? Oh, 100%. Like one, like it was like my first thought when I woke up this morning, I was like, I want to go back. Like, honestly, like I'm at the point, like if I like physically and if I like physically was able to, cause I'm definitely not right now. Um, and time commitment wise, if I could do anything, like if the race was next week, I would do it again. Like I would wow. like, be, and the reason why I say that is because I mean, yes, it's a great race. It's so exciting. I love the course. It's my favorite race I've ever done by far but I'm so excited at all the lessons that I learned. Like that gets me so excited. And I, ma I made millions of mistakes out there, but I'm so pumped because I'm like, oh my gosh, like I loaded my pack so dumb here on this like one section. <laughs> like I know if I can do that next time, it's gonna make it better. And I'm so excited at the opportunity to try that out again. Um, so like, I've like just been like reflecting on all my lessons and like I want to go back and do it as well and like see what I can really do like full potential on the course. Um, but outside of that too, I mean, I get like 100% when you see people coming back four years around a Cocodona, I get it. Like, I mean, yeah, like this is, I mean, just from the uniqueness of the race and the territory and things like that. I mean, yeah. So, and it's one of those things, usually when I wake up, I remember, I mean, I've done Javelina two years in a row and I woke up the next day and I was like, I don't know if I'm ever gonna do this again. Lo and behold, I am doing it again this year. But like, <laughs> I woke up the next day and I was like, I don't think I'm ever doing that race again or running on Pemberton ever again. And uh, yeah, but but Cocodone, I woke up the next day and I was like, I'm 100% doing this race again in the future. Awesome. Yeah. You are officially a Cocodona 250 groupie. You. That's me. <laughs> It's good to be a part of the club. It's good to be a part of the club. And we had a couple of people in the chat asking who's here right now. I'm Shelby Farrell, Shelbs F on Instagram, 2021 Cocodona 250 finisher. Actually, it was like 257 that year. Uh, <laughs> I am Bree Grigsby. I ran the Cocodona 250 in 2022. And we are interviewing Joe Corsion, who just finished running the Cocodona 250 yesterday. Yesterday. I know you guys are like, yeah, I, I ran it this year. And I was like, I ran it yesterday. Yeah. 2024, yeah. baby. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. And we have got another, I believe this is another Sedona Canyons runner. Is Lori that 488? Bowen. Lori Bowen. Lori Bowen is coming in for the finish of Sedona Canyons 125. I'm trying to see. Lori is from Henderson, Nevada. Yeah. Cool, cool. We, we are going to keep things rolling in the studio. Thank you for people in the chat that sent questions to Joe. I know we got individuals wanting to hear about his sleep strategy, but you're going to have to listen to his podcast to find yeah, out when more. Are you, when is the podcast episode coming out uh, yes. on the Every Everyday Ultra Yes. about Cocodona? Or is there going to be more than one episode? You know, it, I thought about that because I will do like a race recap on like a 100K race and it'll be like two hours long. So like thinking about 250 miles. I'm like, I don't know how long that's going to be. So it'll be a long one. Um, but yes, for those who don't know, I run a podcast everyday ultra. I will be recapping everything. And usually what I do too, if you follow me on Instagram, I'm at Joe Corsion. The reason why I put that there is I always put, um, ask your questions on here and I answer every question, even if I have 20, 30, 40, hundred questions. Um, if you follow me on Instagram and you drop that in there, it'll be on a story. I'll post it today. Um, I will answer your question on there too. So um, awesome. Everyday Ultra, you can find it wherever and uh, 
yeah uh, thanks for having me on like, thanks for coming so in awesome. joe so good to see you it's been so, so fun to watch your journey and see you out there and yeah i can't wait to hear the podcast episodes uh, well brie thank you again for takeaways. pacing me it was so awesome sharing those miles with you in sedona and shelby thank you also too for just uh you know uh being awesome I, both of you both of y'all are great friends of mine so it's great here to catch up with you and, and uh talk things cocodona so good to see you and if you need a pacer for javelina and i can uh, get my fitness back after this broken foot give me a holler you did it amazing that that one year so i would love to have you for Sick. sure <laughs> well yeah. cool go cheer on lexi